Well, hey, everyone, we've got a brand new sponsor. BagsUnlimited.com. BagsUnlimited.com has a huge catalog of vinyl supplies, from record sleeves to storage boxes to cardboard mailers, record bags, and more. Whether you're just starting your collection or you're already the biggest record shop in the state, you can buy your vinyl supplies direct at BagsUnlimited.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. Here's your host, the biggest record nerd of them all, Nate Goyer. Well, hey everyone, it's Nate. Welcome to episode 458 of The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for fans and collectors of vinyl records. And ladies and gentlemen, I gotta tell you, today we've got an amazing guest, Mr. Black Dahlia, a frontman, songwriter, founder, head instigator of Dwarves. Uh, Black joins us today to talk records, collectibles, lots, lots more. I mean, you guys know, dwarves have been around and active for decades. They've got a tremendous vinyl catalog. They have a lot of extremely rare records in their collection, in their history. Uh, They've got extreme longevity in the live arena, and the band is constantly pushing envelopes in (laughs) any and all directions. Um, I mean, these guys seemingly have no fear, and we love them for it. The Dwarves' latest LPs, the Dwarves' concept album, and Keep It Real are out. They're on streaming services right now. You can enjoy them this minute if you wish. Also, they are on vinyl. Signed copies, picture discs, limited vinyl runs available at dwarves.merchtable.com. And Dwarves are also playing live. They're touring around. I think they may be in Europe this week. They're getting ready to come down to Australia with me first in the Gimme Gimmies. At uh, You can get tickets there if you're an Aussie, sbmpresents.com. But of course, go to thedwarves.com and you can get all the information on upcoming live shows, albums, recordings, and much more. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, there's a super extended version of this interview only available to show patrons at patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Help support the show. Uh, you get commercial free episodes, high resolution audio, and extended interviews like today's conversation with Blog. That's patreon.com slash vinyl guide. And don't be shy. Help your buddy Nate here keep cranking out these episodes and enjoy all the extras. Patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Alrighty, and with that, let's talk to Mr. Black Dahlia about all things dwarves, vinyl, and beyond. There we go. How's it hey. going? Hey, Mr. Black Dahlia. Well, mate, uh, thank you so much for making the time. I've always wanted to have you on the show, Black, and I can see from behind you all them records. Uh, you, you, you are indeed one of us. It's. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm sorry. It took so long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, one thing that always kind of bummed me out with the Dwarves is that I always thought that we should be like a record heads band. Mm -hmm. But I think like since marketing is everything, you know, we're just uh, a punk band. And most punk bands make shitty records and they're kind of known for like, hey, live, it's pretty good. And so most record heads don't really have a lot of punk records. You know, they have their standard like Ramones record and their and their and their Sex Pistol record. And maybe they have that first wave of hardcore just kind of for collector purposes. But, you know, I think so often punk records suck that it just kind of chased record guys out. And so record guys were like, oh, it's a, you know, Tame Impala bootleg. This will be interesting. Or here's something, you know, that Pavement did 30 years ago. That's interesting. You know, and it's like, no, it's not. You know? <laughs> It's like punk punk records when they're good are good and they deserve a spot. You know, I mean, what I've tried to do is make a record that was listenable for your ears and interesting and still had that element of punk rock, you know, and it's 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 mm-hmm. kind of rare, I think. Well, look, I, you know, from from my view, you know, there, there's all sorts of different type of record collectors. There's absolutely those audiophiles that sit next to us. So you could you really hear the Steely Dan's, you know, the reverb on this <laughs> record, you know, and they've got a, you know, twenty thousand dollar turntable or whatever. I, I Those clearly exist. And there's there's quite a few of them. Uh, but a lot of folks, especially ones who listen to the show, we do a lot of punk records here. And there's a lot of collectible ones. And it's actually quite uh, quite hard to find good condition original 
punk records, right? And yeah, because we didn't care, you know, we just threw them on and played them and threw them to the side, and we weren't like collecting things. I, I like, I always loved records, and I always wanted to have a bunch of them, but I never really collected them in that sense of like keeping them in nice shape and keeping them organized and doing whatever. Like for me, it was really more utilitarian, you know, just like I want to hear this, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they were absolutely, most of them were well-loved and uh, still have the battle scars to, to, to prove it. So let's get it. So, so you are a bit of a record nerd. You still listen to records. You still buy records. Kind of what's your rhythm with, with records? Oh, no. I mean, I've slacked off a lot. You know, I was, I went very hard on records all through junior high, high school, and, and really through my twenties, I guess. Um, but you know, I I was so poor for so long. You know, I sort of grew up in a in a in a middle class suburb, and it was fine. And I dealt drugs, so I had money, and I bought all kinds of cool records. And then, you know, once I was on my own and had a band, I just didn't have any money. And so, very quickly, it was like like I remember the first wave of stuff I got when I didn't have any money was you know we'd move to San Francisco in the eighties and all of these people were like tragically dying, you know, but it meant they'd be on the street, you know, somebody would die and then you'd get like all of their Sylvester records or all of their <laughs> Casey and the sunshine band records or whatever it was, you know? So the first thing I remember going, wow, I kind of missed the boat on this disco stuff. This was actually really great. And I enjoy this, you know? So that was the first time I was like, Oh yeah, cheap, cheap stuff you know and then that was still in the days when you could get stuff at thrift stores and stuff you'd come mm -hmm. across like some cool records and whatever at a thrift store or an antique shop and it'd be like cool you know um but i really stopped spending any money at record stores and i think the other thing that happened i think blood guts came out when i was maybe 24 25 and at that point i looked at it and i was like wow, this is a great record. Like, I'm proud of this record. And this is the first one I made that really ticks the different buttons for me. And so, like, once I was making records, I didn't really care about other people's, you know, and collecting them and looking at them. Like, I used... It all became science at that point. It was like, I'm listening to your record to try and figure out how to make my next record. Mm. You know, like while 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 we made Blood Guts and Pussy, the only records I was listening to was you know Easy Does It by Easy -E and and you know Straight Out of Compton, and you don't really see any influence of those records. There's no hip hop influence on the record themselves, but it was more the idea of like, wow, the hip hop guys have finally caught up, and they're not just going like, hey, party people, they're they're like really giving you the dirt now. And that sort of happened in the late 80s. And so, like, a lot of the records that I made were kind of informed by other records, but not necessarily in an obvious way. You know, I didn't suddenly throw a sideways baseball cap on and go, yo, you know. <laughs> but it was like, but, but that was the record I was listening to. And so records were always in the background. Like, I was a collector in that sense that they were, like, informing what I did, you know, when I... When I started to hear electronica records, I was like, okay, maybe we can work this in. You know, when I heard speed metal records or, or you know, kind of industrial, you know, I, I would register it in the back of my mind. Like, hmm, okay, you know, this we can work into the next record we do. Let's figure this out. But I never like went off again and was like, I'm going to buy every ministry record because I like ministry. Like it wasn't. I used it more as a way to make records. Right. But the way I've seen, and again, outsider's perspective, obviously, uh, dwarves and your solo career seems to really understand the collectability. Like, for example, the limited covers, the different oh, colors, right. those sort of things. It's like you, you, you understand, well, maybe you just understand your fan base really well, but also the collectors in us. Yeah. When, as soon as they announce the new dwarves with a special cover, it's like, I, I need to get that. I don't know why. The universe is telling me I need to get that before it's gone. Yeah, I'm so glad that people do that, too, because it's also... You know, I remember reading in Iggy Pop's book, you know, years ago, he wrote a book called I Need More. And he talked about like what it means to be famous. I mean, Iggy now is just like the god of rock. And everyone would say, this guy was amazing. But even when I was in high school, 
almost nobody knew who Iggy Pop was. You know, he had an outsized influence on punk rockers. But in the mainstream, it just wasn't even discussed. You know, now at this point, it's this iconic guy, you know. But he talked about how, like, most people's popularity, you know, they'll sell a million records to a bunch of people who don't really care about it just because that was the record to buy right then. And he said, you know, some people's, you know, some people's fan base is a mile wide, you know, mine's a mile deep, you know. And I think with the dwarves, it's like that. The people who really appreciate it, it's like, okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of different layers to drill down on here, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get every last thing on vinyl, I'm always going to put a cool cover on it. I'm always going to do something for you that makes it worth it that you love this band so much because most people are just oblivious to it. I mean, I still play punk festivals and people routinely walk up and go, oh, you guys were great. I never heard about you guys. And I just think like, fuck, you know, <laughs> I've been around for 40 years doing this fucking band. Like it, you never heard of it, but it's true because marketing is everything. And, you know, you, you, you know, a lot of people still don't know what this band is. And so they get to rediscover it. And yeah, it's just fun to give them a variety of things to get. And then in this modern incarnation, you know, I have a great lawyer, John Gentile. He's also an artist. And he was like, hey, can I make a board game for the dwarves? I'm like, that sounds great. And all of a sudden, you've got these deluxe editions of the record with a board game with this involved game that have all this shit. Yeah, or stuff like that. John made that <laughs> where it was like we were going to Vegas to do one show this year, and he said, Oh, I'll make a roulette wheel. I mean, I just feel really lucky that people like that are so dedicated to the to the group, you know, because then you really get to see the depth of how people feel about us as opposed to just the wideness. Who, you know, who who had to go before who at the festival? Who was bigger than the other, you know? Uh, that's like one criterion and the other criterion is like no you know the fans of this band are deep you know they love it so yeah i've heard it uh, said that uh, you know in in the modern era um a band really needs what uh, a few thousand fans dedicated fans to kind of keep them going to keep them touring to keep uh, you know the product coming out and to allow them to to make a respectable living or existence so I would imagine that's quite true with dwarves. There's a there, there's there are rabid fans around the world that reach out yeah. and, and 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 they trust you when you put something out when you when you take a chance with something like Ralph Champagne. They're they're along for the ride. <laughs> I wish more people would have come along for that particular ride. It's hard. Like every time we make a punk record, what you're saying is absolutely true. Ralph Champagne is a little bit of a harder sell because. A lot, a lot of the diehard Doors fans, like, they love punk records, and they don't really care about a more retro, loungy record like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, you're right. Like, there was a subset of Doors fans who were like, this is so genius. Like, I can't believe you came up with this. And for me, you know, Ralph Champagne was really a lifetime in coming because, like you say, this whole time I've had a punk band, and it's kind of known for punk overkill that's it, it, punk music really rarely animated me in my life. I think there was a pretty brief period when it did. I mean, really for me, I kind of came in with sixties garage rockabilly records, the kind of retro things, black arm B records, stuff like that. And then at a certain point, you know, from touring so much, it was just knocking my brain in. And so then it became like twenties records and cab Calloway records and the Boswell sisters records. And that was the only thing I could handle listening to if I was going to listen to anything. Cause it's like, fuck, you know, I'm, my brain is getting beaten in by this shit night after night. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, so I kind of forget that the basis of this band is like people who love punk records. And so like with Ralph Champagne, I feel like that's like on a slow burn. Like the people who really got it were like, Holy shit, man. You know, you really delivered on this thing. And I felt so good about that. I mean, you know, I'm in my late 50s now. And I was in my mid 50s. When I made that record. And it was like, it's very rare that people have like an epiphany in their life and can make a completely different kind of record mm -hmm. that late in life, you know. So again, just to make that, I felt really lucky, you know, like, wow, you know, like some people are going to get this and understand you know and and it'll just make them appreciate the dwarves that much more because the dwarves are never afraid to be stupid 
most punk bands were and most metal bands are you know they're like well no really we're smart here's my smart song about smart things you know it's like you ain't that smart buddy like i know you think you are and god bless you you know but you ain't that smart and you ain't that good a player if you're making punk records make a fucking punk record and go for it and have some emotion and so you know since we weren't bending over backwards to make people feel like we were smart then you make something like Ralph Champagne and people go, oh, holy shit, like this is actually pretty smart. And you go, yeah, it was it, you know, it's always been that way, you know. It's interesting because, you know, obviously your, your latest record, well, not Keep It Real, that's coming out and we'll talk about that here in a bit. But the album prior with the roulette wheel here, um, the concept album. Concept album, yeah. Obviously th that title's tongue in cheek, like most of the dwarves album titles but yeah you, but you write books you've written stories why hasn't there been a, a dwarves concept album an actual <laughs> concept album yeah i mean it's a good idea and you know i think there's elements of that like with the concept album we just had so much material post pandemic that really to me it felt like the white album like okay it's mm -hmm. a sprawling thing with a lot of different genres and it's so long, let's make a double album. But then the commercial reality of that comes out and you realize like, you know, if we make a full length and then an EP a year later, a lot more people are going to be excited about it and buy it. And it's a chance to make new art, you know, but really the original idea is more like the concept CD, which has 26 songs on it. It's a lot of material and it's more like sprawling and it goes over the thing. And so that to me felt more like a quote unquote concept album. But the Doors have always had kind of reprises of things like Sgt. Pepper and, and have always had like self-referential things like Glass Onion, where we mention our own band or our own song, it, like self-referential things. So to that, it always... You know, I feel like it, it, we we do touch on kind of the concept album every time. You know, there's always this kind of, and they always play like mixtapes. I mean, I mm -hmm. like it when people appreciate that. The reason this is a record is because it flows together in a certain way, which is different than just making a cool jam for Apple Tunes and going, well, this was the hit. Right. You know, it's like, well, you know, it's like the difference between writing a short story and writing a, a novel, you know. But I, I, I would be interested in doing a whole concept album or doing a play or a musical. <laughs> um, I just don't know that I'd have the energy to do it in the dwarves context. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's, I think I might have the energy to do that with like some collaborators that were approaching things that way. You know, the yeah. dwarves is still kind of a pure like, you know, we don't rehearse and then we go out and play a show and kick your ass because we're all good and we all know how to do it, you know? And when you lose that element, you know, cause when you, when you start really making these very advanced things, you can kind of lose that element. You know, I like to keep, keep the powder dry, keep the guys fresh and playing yeah. shit that they're good at and that they appreciate. And then I kind of tie it together in the mix and production, you know, phase of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it's a good question. I don't know. You know, it's like, the older you get too, the more it's like, fuck, we're running out of time. You know, if we're ever going to do this, we got to do that. You know? <laughs> I need to make I, my big statement now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? well, so, well, I mean, but you just being an author, that's why it kind of struck me like, well, of course, if someone's going to string a narrative together there, I don't think there's been a punk concept album really. Uh, correct me if you, you know, differently, but you know, and, well, again, I sang on one for, um, Ben Weasel, who made a pretty interesting thing called Baby Fat a few years ago, mm -hmm. which was like an opera and everything was sung in it and it had a storyline. And he kind of gave me the best songs, which I thought was interesting. I, usually somebody would keep keep the best songs for themselves, but he had written these good songs. He gave them to me. Um, it, you know, so some some people have touched on that. I, I guess I guess for me the mindset that I get into writing a book is much more empathetic. I I think about other characters and I think, Hmm, you know, how would this teenage girl feel? But also how would this 60 year old man feel? Or how would this teacher feel? You know, how would this psychologist feel like whoever's in the scene? Mm -hmm. Whereas with the dwarves, it's very like me, fuck you. This is how I feel. I'm a man. 
I'm this tall, I'm this strong, I've been around this long, and this is how I feel. And so it doesn't really give me an empathetic, like, oh, I want to see what your view is quality. Like, whereas if I'm writing a book, then it's more meditative and you go back and I think, wow, you know how, how, I wonder how those teachers felt when I was doing blah, blah, blah. And I, and I wonder how that psychologist felt when I said, blah, 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 you know, mm-hmm. like it isn't so self-centered anymore. But you've explored alter egos. Ralph Champagne's a perfect example of that. Is, who, is, right. is, is Ralph Champagne closer to you as a person than Black Dahlia? <laughs> Yeah, probably. Yeah, because Blag is is really so overkill and so, you know, kill, fuck, destroy, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think Ralph Champagne's a little closer to the me, which is more like I'd like a record I could listen to that isn't <laughs> pounding my head in. And I'd like to say something kind of clever and get a laugh as opposed to get you to go, oh, shit, that guy's crazy. So yeah. Ra- let me put it this way. Ralph Champagne pays his rent where Black Dahlia rapes the landlord. <laughs> right. <Exactly. laughs> That's a perfect way to look at it. Or I guess more accurate might be Ralph Champagne, you know, has a girlfriend that pays the rent, you know. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> These days, you pretty much put Dwarves material through your own label, Greedy. Is that right? Yeah, which I always just wanted as an imprint. You know, like I wanted it to be like, let's put it out on somebody else's label that has big distribution and can help me with marketing and whatever. But, you know, it, it after being affiliated with so many labels, you know, and, and a lot of the big indie labels, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, fucking Sub Pop and Epitaph were two of the biggest ever, Sympathy for the Record Industry, one of the mm-hmm. biggest ever. So, you know, I feel like I got my shot in that world. And the fact is, you know, labels aren't really doing marketing for people anymore and they're not really talking to the radio for people anymore and they're not really doing anything a- anymore and especially the kind of old guy labels that i would be on so mm-hmm. i sort of had to do it myself but it's not something that i relish doing or that i do particularly well you know once the product is made the art's done the music's done I don't know how to market shit. I don't know how to get it out there. I don't know what a smart amount of units to make is. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I wish I had somebody doing it, you know, who was hip to all that stuff. But what I found was, you know, like the last label I was affiliated with was Burger, which of course had that weird scandal, which was so mindless. I, I, they chased those guys out of the music industry. They never did anything. It was, it was, nobody even accused them of anything. What they said was like, oh, some band that you like that you put out a cassette of was staying at, at your house when he did such and such or whatever right. it was. I mean, a lot of stupid It was very, it was very witch hunt. And I I really feel like those guys got a very bad deal. And I was also really bummed to be left out of the sex scandal. I mean, I had seven (laughs) reprints with those guys and everybody was talking about uh, burger. And I'm like, well, is anybody going to pull out my shit? And it was like, you know, you're old then when like, you're not even invited to the sex scandal. You know what I mean? Really? I I, like shit. I'm that harmless now, you know? Um, but you know, and but the thing with Burger was, <laughs> I love them. They love me, but they couldn't even afford to keep my shit in print at the rate it was selling. So I was like, "Well, fuck, dude, I can afford it. I'll, I'll just have my own label and I'll keep it in print. That's about all that it'll be." You know how how, um, how hands on are you with the label? I mean, are you like ordering records? Are you selecting colors yeah. of vinyl? You're doing it all. Yeah, right? I have to do all that stuff. Like I say, I don't relish it. I'm not good at it. You know, I'm good at the part of making the art. And then when it gets to like, how many do we make? Where do these go? Mm -hmm. You know, I I just look at the numbers and go, shit, you know, we got one distributor in Australia and they got barely any of my records, you know? So I wrote to the guy and said, Hey, we're going to Australia. Maybe you can get a few more of my records. And, you know, that's about the best I can do. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. And I don't know how to market things, and I I feel uncomfortable with it. Mm-hmm. And you know, it doesn't it generates enough money to keep me alive and comfortable, but not really enough to have like employees and people that I'm paying to do shit. I mean, right. you turn around and you've given somebody 
30, 40, 50 grand, but you know, they haven't increased your sales 30, 40, 50 grand, you know, right. maybe they took some of the work off your plate, but most of the work was explaining to them what you wanted and how to do it, you know? So, you know, it would be great to find somebody who wanted to run the label and had a realistic view of it and could grow it because mm -hmm. it, cause it could be grown. You know, it's, I'm not, you know, I, I always feel like every time I sell 5,000 records, I probably could have sold 10. Right. Just like every time I play a festival and I go on at three o'clock and I got five grand, I probably could have gone on at six o'clock and gotten 10 grand if there was anybody who gave a shit, you know, but it's like, you know, I it, it's, that really is the hardest part of the music industry for me. Mm hmm when it's just me running things, I work with people smoothly and perfectly when it's like, I'm your agent or I'm your label or I'm your publicist. Then it's like, okay, fuck. You didn't do this, 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 and this, you did do this, this, and this, that I didn't like, you know, right. and all of a sudden it's these adversarial relationships. When the relationships I have with people that I just hire and pay to do things are always smooth and perfect. I never have a problem with anybody. It's always like, you know, all of a sudden you get a booking agent and now you're making a thousand dollars less per show. And it's like, well, dude, I got to pay you a commission and I'm making less. And it's like, but I made a phone call for you. Yeah, you did. And you got me less. And, you know, I don't know what the fuck is up. I know right. what you, you want to sit at home and make one phone call and get some money. I get it, you know, but it's just like, you know, so it, it, it all gets very confusing in that world. You know, I, I don't always know when I'm just being fussy or unrealistic, like with publicists, you know, I was used to publicists from like sub pop and epitaph. They're, they're hired by the label. They work there. You can go talk to them and then they horse trade a little bit and they would go, Hey, you know, you want this Nirvana article? Could you just mention the dwarves a little bit and whatever, you know, publicists now is like, you're paying them to send one email for you to a mass group of people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, really? I gave you $3,000 a month for four months to send the same email to a bunch of people. That was, it was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> and you didn't follow up on anything and you didn't talk to anybody. And then you kind of shrugged your shoulders and went, I guess nobody's interested. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm not interested in emails that come into my <laughs> inbox either. I go delete, you know, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, like you didn't do any work, you know, but to their mind, it's like, this is what publicists do. You send mm -hmm. out an email. You know, it's like so your understanding of things changes in the different experiences you've had. And sometimes it's just I'm an old guy and I don't know how things work anymore, you know, but but often it's just like. Yeah, you're fundamentally lazy and you just want to make money off me. Well, you know, <laughs> you've also been around enough to where you you kind of know how it works. You're aware of these sort of pitfalls. But what is it? What is it that you like to do? Hey there, all you record nerds. I want to tell you about BagsUnlimited.com. BagsUnlimited.com has a huge selection of vinyl record supplies. Whether you collect LPs, 7-inch singles, 78 shellacs, or anything in between, BagsUnlimited.com will sort you out. From polyline sleeves to cardboard record mailers to 7-inch storage boxes and archive quality record sleeves, protect your records of any size and shape at BagsUnlimited.com. Whether you have a small personal record collection or you're running a massive record shop you can grab a small supply or even buy in bulk at bagsunlimited.com and they've got some really incredible unique stuff bagsunlimited.com even has special size sleeves made especially to protect your box sets storage boxes and sleeves for cassette tapes protective supplies for reel to reel and yes even eight tracks just go to bagsunlimited.com click on audio supplies and and prepare to be impressed by all the options they have. That's bagsunlimited.com. You've also been around enough to where you you kind of know how it works. You're aware of these sort of pitfalls. But what is it what is it that you like to do? It, live songwriting, yeah, recording. I love writing songs. Mm -hmm. I like being in the studio and hearing things. I'm not I'm not a complete like boffin guy at all. I, I need, I work with a guy named Andy Carpenter, who's an amazing engineer, producer, musician guy, 
who helps me make much better records. And prior to that, it was Eric Valentine, who's a legendary producer. And we just happen to be buddies. And so I got very spoiled from on that, on that end of, of, you know, having great musicians like a Josh Freezer and Nick Oliveri that just play their asses off and then having a great engineer producer guys like, like Eric Valentine or Andy Carpenter. But I like being in the studio. I like going, Hmm, that was cool. Or that could be better. Or we could change that. So that's another part of it. I like being on stage is great. I mean, I live for that. And I think I was, you know, kind of made to perform, you know, and whether it's doing that or just talking to an audience, um, emceeing a show, you know. So those are the types of things that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I also enjoy stuff like this, like talking about the process, just talking about songs. I'm I'm starting a podcast. Um, I just trying to amass a bunch of shows, but it's sort of just about songs. So I'll just talk to an individual about a cool song either that they wrote and did or just that we all love you know i talked mm. with salt peter about 50 ways to leave your lover you know it's like i could talk about songs forever you know or approaches that people took so i guess the hands-on stuff is the fun part for me and then the part that's like doing the office work i'm not trained to do uh excel spreadsheets and things i don't know how to do it i don't know how to read information that business trained people know how to do mm -hmm. you know um and then part of it is just like shit even when you do all that stuff right you still need to have x amount of people that are interested in buying your stuff and i'm still very much a cult artist mm -hmm. so even if everybody does all their jobs right i mean sometimes people look at me and go dude i had the conversation with the venue they don't want you or i look i talked to the website they don't want you you know what I mean? And then you got to kind of be realistic and be like, okay, you know, I get it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the other thing in the music industry is that everybody likes to spare your feelings. So nobody tells you the truth. Right. It's like, just tell me the fucking truth, man. I'm saying to you, can you get this skull design of mine at retail? And you're giving me all this bullshit, but what you really want to say is, you know, no, they don't want it at retail. Right. You know, nobody's <laughs> buying it. And it's like, okay, why don't you just tell me that? Right. You know, because everybody's in los angeles and they need their feelings spared you know it's like i i come from illinois dude don't yeah. spare my feet just yeah. tell me what the fuck's <laughs> tell me the going real on. deal so yeah but you, know. you mentioned earlier I, I think i heard you say this you you look after a lot of the artwork are you hands-on photoshop doing that sort of thing or what no what do you do? i okay. i'm not talented with that i just have a vision and i say things to people you know blood guts being one of the most famous ones you know, I took the Initium album by Sam Hain and I went to a great photographer who I'd been referred to uh, by a friend and, you know, my, Michael Levine. And I said, I want this, but with chicks and a dwarf, you know, <laughs> and then he is the eye behind it and makes it, you know, and then like that logo, the dwarves logo, which I like a lot. That was just somebody who did art for sub pop as she came up with. And I thought it looked great. And it was like, cool, you know, so um, You're talking the skull and boners thing. No, the skull oh. and boners drawn by John Strauss, who was Salt Peter's brother and a buddy of mine in high school. Okay. That's a great illustration, and I love that because it's like a serious, seriously drawn and detailed skull, which is very cool. But it's got a smile and dicks through it. You know, it's just very <laughs> funny. Um, no, but just the logo that just says dwarves. You know, it's funny how things like that affect you. When I saw that, I was like, wow, somebody took the time to. Because I was in the hand draw days. You couldn't just grab a font. Right. And so, you know, she, this Jane Higgins, I think her name was, she was up in Seattle and she hand drew that and it looks nice and I like it, you know, and it's like, wow, all right. You know, um, so uh, I've had to rely on the talents of people, just like I rely on the talents of engineers and producers, also uh, uh, visual artists, you know, and I've been lucky to have good photographers and layout people, you know. So, for example, with Keep It Real, there's a there's a series of, I think, a couple hundred special covers that are Magical Mystery Tour parodies. Right. You, and you've got parodies. Almost every album has some sort of limited parody to it. Well, so, that's all from John Gentile, who runs uh, punk, punknews.org and is my attorney. And he's wow. just a great guy and a very good attorney and a smart guy. But he's just got a very active brain and he loves to do stuff. 
And for him, it's like most bands are so precious about everything that he'll have a funny idea. And they're like, I don't think we want to do that, you know. And for me, it's like, yeah, man, shit. He he came up with that Who Killed He Who board game. It wasn't my idea. He came up with the Magical Mystery parody. Julia Lofstrand took that photo. She's a great photographer. Takes a lot of, a lot of photos for us. And so, yeah, it's a combination of things. Like you get a good photo and you give it to him. And then, you know, but that was all, all of those ideas. He parodied songs in the key of life and the joy division record and yeah. all these things. I mean, he, he's just an expansive guy with a smart brain. It'd be a lawyer all day. And then he wants to make some art. So he made some art for me. I mean, I, like I say, man, I feel really lucky when these people come in and they want to do things for mm. me because I couldn't have done it without them. And half the time it wasn't even my idea. You know, it was, that was all the parodies were his idea. And yeah, for this magical mystery thing, you know, I had a cool photo and, and so, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, I, I feel lucky when that stuff happens, you know? Oh, I didn't realize it was John. I got to bring that up next time because I, I love those parodies and they're so well done. You know, they like are. you said, the songs in the yeah. key of life, and the you know the 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 other ones, uh, the sticky fingers and Ramones, and the yeah, all those things are are so clever. So I, I didn't realize. And that I love John. that for record collectors, and I think they should tie that together with the Dwarves. That we are a record collectors band, we are a vinyl band. If you go and you listen to it with your headphones on, you're going to catch the twentieth time you listen to it that you didn't catch, mm -hmm. right? But people aren't used to that in this genre. Like I said, they're used to it in the shoegazer genres. They're used to it in the like, hey, we make sound, you know. What about that Sonic Youth record? <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, well, that's, you know, that's not my genre, but I still want to perk your ears up and do interesting mm -hmm. things to it. You know, so it's my hope that as the years go on, the doors will more and more be recognized as a record heads band, but I don't know if it'll ever happen. You know, maybe, maybe not. I, I, I don't know my personal feeling. And again, not blowing smoke or anything, but my personal feeling is dwarves are rife for a Renaissance, you know, to be celebrated. <laughs> they, they should be a band that's celebrated and why you guys weren't on something like no values in the late afternoon oh, or I know. Early evening is like, that's ludicrous, you know, yeah, uh, a foundational yeah. pillar, I think. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, that just came down to booking agents, you know. I, I had a bad streak with booking agents uh, dealing with guys who I've known for decades. And it's just like, they got old. Yeah. They don't do shit anymore. And then they try and just shuffle you off to some younger person who doesn't know or care about you. And it's like, dude, I, I hired you. I know you. Uh, uh, come on. You know, it's like, well, I'm busy and I got my kid and my wife and I... You know, and you just sit there and go, uh. and again, you know, but part of it is being real about what you have. Did we deserve to be on no values? Yeah. Did we deserve to be there more than some bands that were there? Yeah. But it came down to who had a booking agent, who was in there scrambling, who got you the gig and I didn't have it. And so that's also where you got to just dust yourself off and realize, okay, that's just reality. You know, mm -hmm. dwarves are always going to be a little too cool for school. We're always going to be a little too cool for whatever the mainstream is of anything that's just kind of how it is and we get by with a little help from our friends you know mm -hmm. and whether it's with making of the art or the marketing of the art or the marketing of the tour or whatever it's kind of like you can still see the dwarves some nights with 50 people in the crowd on a tuesday in some bumfuck town because that's kind of the way that it shook out you know yeah. it isn't the way i wanted it I, I I agree with you. I mean, we more than deserve a renaissance, you know, for the quality of the live show we do and the quality of the records we made, we should, we should be there. And it shouldn't just be punk festivals. You know, we did riot fest 10 years ago and they never had us back. And it's like, why not? We're great. And I come from Chicago, you know, it's like, or I come from Illinois anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it was like, shit, you know, it's hard to say why these people do what they do, why they book, how they book and, you know, who you turned off by saying or doing this or that thing. I think over the last few years, there's never been a me too scandal with the dwarves. There's no, you know, and in fact, we're kind of inoculated from that because we've been discussing sex, drugs, violence, death from the very beginning in the most graphic terms. So it's like, what, what, you didn't know what this band was? Like, are you serious? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? 
So in that way, it's been nice. But on the other hand, a lot of people have just been like, you know, we played Pooza Fest several times in Montreal. And then at a certain point, it was like, oh, we are scared. You know, everyone is talking about bad men and the bad things that they do, you know. And it's just like, what the fuck does that have to do with me? I didn't do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. But And nobody said I did anything. But, you know, if you say fuck enough in your songs and you have enough naked women and you, and you have enough scandals and stuff around your band, then people... There's a certain amount of people that just go, yeah, good luck. Thanks. You know, we'll go with what's easy. And what's funny is, you know, it's like anti-flag got every show. Oh, then it turns out everybody's saying dudes are rapists, you know, like I, I don't know the story there, but it's like all, all of these bands that you thought were such nice guys, all of these bands that, that colored in the lines and didn't say fuck in their song and didn't push the boundary and didn't change genres and were all kind of nice boys and had a nice agent oh it turns out they're raping people oh it turns out they're shitheads oh turns out they they fucked everybody over in their band and stole all the money turns out this and that you know mm. what i mean we never had any of that in the dwarves you know but we have a rep and so with that rep comes you know a lot of people just going yeah good luck Thanks. You know, whoever put together no values, they probably had heard of the dwarves and considered the dwarves, but A, there was no agent pushing them. And B, they were kind of like, eh, you know, we could do without the scandal. Let's get somebody safe. You know, these days you control what you put out. You've got, you know, you could put whatever covers and artwork you want on it. Prior to that, when you did have to work with folks like Sub Pop or, or Epitaph or Sympathy, whoever, did you get a lot of pushback? Was was there a lot of resistance about your creative choices? And were there ones, were there choices that you had to compromise on uh, when there was a different vision that you had originally proposed? Uh, you know, I have my issues with Sub Pop and I had issues with Epitaph, but it was never that either of them told me I couldn't make the song I wanted to or that I couldn't, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, make the cover I wanted to. I have to commend them both on that. They let me make my art, even though it was their label. They came up short, both of them, in terms of promoting that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it was like, yeah, we made this and it was kind of a little feather in our cap because it's nasty, but <laughs> we're not putting anything into this. And they both did that. Um, and that was hurtful. But again, you know, I made my bed and I had to lie in it. Screaming fuck was not as commercially viable as, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, mosquito libido, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just different. And so... Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, you know, the issues I had with sub pop was, uh, um, <clears throat> it ripping me off a lot, lying a lot about, about the money and the things, and then taking all my shit out of print when we were off the label. Um, the issues with epitaph were different. I really got along very well with most of the, most of the people there. And, you know, I always appreciated that Brett from Bad Religion, you know, when we when I had first sent him Young and Good Looking, uh, uh, you know, he's uh, I've sent him demos and, and things that were in the process of being made. And he just sent me a couple grand out of the blue. Like, hey, you know, good luck to you. Like, I'm not ready to sign this, but I hope you keep going. Mm -hmm. And that really meant so much to me at that time, you know, when Sub Pop had thrown us over and and told a bunch of lies about you know we we had let them in on the whole he who hoax thing they were part of it but then they felt weird and it, you know uh they lied about it and, oh so they uh, distanced themselves after the fact yes, of that okay yes and at the same time that last record sugar fix you know they were preparing to go to warner and they didn't bring that record over there but they were suing Caroline, so Caroline wasn't covering their product. So it was just this weird thing where it was like you couldn't get that record if you wanted to. Um, and it, there was just a lot of de of <laughs> deception and bullshit from Sub Pop. Um, and it's funny because I really like the person who is the CEO over there now, Megan. Mm -hmm. uh, I always liked her. We were always friends. She didn't have anything to do with the, the way that I was treated there. 
but I deeply hate sub pop and the people who, who, who ran it and the way they treated people. And, and, you know, I'm never going to backpedal on that. I own those records again. That's my shit. You know, for mm -hmm. a long time, I couldn't say what I wanted because they own my shit, but didn't put it out, which is very low. It's just a low, dirty, shitty thing for human beings to do. You know, I'm an artist. At least let my music exist. And so I really hated the people at Sub Pop, which was much different than Epitaph. Epitaph was more, you know, because I was there for the first leg of Sub Pop. I helped them be what they were. Pre-Nirvana, Sub Pop was a bit of a mess, right? They didn't have money. Yeah, more in. than a bit. Yeah. More than a bit. And you couldn't get any money, and it was really fucked up over there. And so they owed me. And when they hit it big, they should have helped me. And they did just the opposite and really helped to bury my career for no reason. And so I definitely have bitterness toward toward the, those people and that label, and I don't mention them for the most part. Um, with Epitaph, they made their money and had done their thing. I didn't have anything to do with putting those guys on the map. They were on the map. Okay. And, um, you know, but they brought me in, and then there was just a series of kind of unfortunate incidents that didn't have anything to do with my band. It was personnel over there getting in trouble with the law and with rehabs and just kind of, I went there with one expectation and promise of a deal. And then it all just kind of fell apart very quickly mm -hmm. because they were sort of in the process of falling apart and having issues, but it wasn't like I helped put them on the map. They helped, they helped me, you know? Um, and so my relations with them were always much better, even after we were, dropped by them and whatever um you know i'll still talk to people over there and still um mm -hmm. uh you know they'll they just recently let me reprint come clean you know which is their record mm -hmm. uh they just gave it to me to to reprint which i thought was very nice of them so my, my relationship with them was always different but i guess i've i've gone off on a tangent here i mean uh you know maybe the initial question was just about running a record label. Do I enjoy it? I mean, the answer is no, I, I don't. I, I always just wanted to have an imprint, you know, it's like, okay, this is yeah. on Greek because I produced this record and I came up with this artwork and that's it. Um, running my own label holds no appeal for me at all. Mm -hmm. In, in the, in the early nineties, when, you know, obviously Nirvana hit it big, everyone was scooping up all sorts of, of bands did any majors, major majors, approach dwarves? Oh, and hey, record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by naming your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code Vinyl Guide 10. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code Vinyl Guide 10. Hey there, audiophiles. If you're seeking stylish furniture to showcase your stereo and record collection, well, look no further than SidetrackedWorkshop.com. Sidetracked Workshop designs extraordinarily elegant record cabinets and consoles that add sophistication and panache to your music hobby. Handcrafted in the good old USA in the vinyl-loving city of Portland, Oregon, Sidetracked Workshop's designs are a music lover's dream. Made with real walnut, veneer wood, and brass accents, these gorgeous designs add class and taste to the record room and ship fully assembled assembled and ready to enjoy. Just check out the designs for yourself at sidetrackedworkshop.com. Look, you spend thousands of dollars on records. Don't keep them in a crate and don't risk your records on those feeble wooden pegs from Ikea. Your music deserves the dignity of Sidetracked Workshop. That's sidetrackedworkshop.com. Elegant solutions for the vinyl lifestyle. In the early 90s, when, you know, obviously Nirvana hit it big, everyone was scooping up all sorts of, of bands. Did any majors, major majors, approach Dwarves at all? Were there yeah, any you know, every band on Sub Pop got a major label deal, 100% of them, except the Dwarves. And we were not approached by anyone. 
and uh, not even conversations. Let's do dinner. Let's do this. And nothing. I had dinner with other bands and their reps from labels. Like, hey, Blag's our buddy. Let's invite him along. And they're like, sure, you can eat on Electra's dime, you know. But there was never any talk about giving me a deal anywhere. No. Mm -hmm. Um, We were considered to be stupid because we had pussy in our title, Blood, Guts, and Pussy, and we sang songs with fuck in the title, and there were naked people. Also, punk rock was not popular at that time. It was before the the pop punk revival in the mid 90s when all the punk punk bands and as a result of green day and offspring became popular again so in that period when i was young enough for a record deal when and when labels were throwing money around i i did go to a few dinners but never they were never interested in the dwarves and 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 again this is partly testament to how you know game recognized game you should be able to listen to blood guts and pussy and understand the the pop undertones of that Mm -hmm. but a lot of people can't because they're seduced away by album covers and production and a person screaming fuck you know but the fact is there's a bunch of catchy jams on there Mm -hmm. and within a couple years i you know i had written the dwarves are young and good looking which arguably is our most kind of pop punk thing so if people at record labels were a little smarter and actually knew what a good songwriter was and actually knew what interesting production was, they should have picked up on us. Instead, they picked up on like, Ooh, this looks like Nirvana part 28. Mm-hmm. And they picked up on shit like, you know, candle box. It's sort of like Pearl jam, which is sort of like Soundgarden, which is kind of like, you know, they, they went down that rabbit hole. And so when you do that, you, you're not, you know, that's definitely a place where the music industry slept on me. Because even if you leave aside what the dwarves are, they just could have made money off me as a songwriter. You know, I'm a good songwriter. I'm a good lyricist. I teamed up with guys like like Eric Valentine, you know, because they believed in in me. But nobody from a label believed in my shit because they're all what you see is what you get. You know, you said fuck. We're not trying to say fuck here at London Records, you know. Okay, you know, w- you know, you have tits on your album, but we don't have tits on this record from Electra. I'm like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. they should have been smart enough to see that I was ripe for exploitation and that there was some money that could have been made off me, mm-hmm. but they never saw that, and that's why I'm disgusted with the music industry generally. I understand that they need to make money. I get it. And I understand that maybe the vessel of the dwarves, they didn't feel was going to make them money. Although, you know, one of the most interesting things, uh, I think it was 1995 or something, a woman called me who used to work at Sub Pop as a publicist. And she was a friend of, uh, of mine. And she said, hey, I, I want you to see this band. They're playing at the Warfield tonight. I'm going to be in San Francisco if you want to go. So I went with her and we saw... um uh, uh, Marilyn Manson, you know, she was like, do you like this? What do you think? And I was like, damn, you know, this stage set looks like the Nuremberg trials and it's fucking, these costumes are amazing and everything that's happening here. And the music is very derivative of ministry and these types of things. Like this is going to be a hit. I, I think it's a smart sign for you guys. And she looked at me and said, yeah, you know, they're like the band you love to hate. You know what I mean? Like nobody's done that. And I was just like, <laughs> there was this brief pause. And then she looked at me and she was like, oh, <laughs> you know, and I was like, okay, you know, you've just summed up my whole experience in the music industry. Marilyn Manson has a couple million dollar deal with an enormous label, Interscope. And so you've marketed it as it's the band you love to hate. Isn't it scary? Look at this Nazi imagery. Look at this androgynous imagery. Look at, look at, look at what's happening here. Isn't this great? And isn't it shaking you out of your torpor? And it's like, bitch, you were my publicist. (laughs) I had the same idea with a different genre, but you didn't get it because there was $5,000 behind it instead of $2 million behind it. And so being taken seriously in the music industry is all a function of having big management or having a big budget or having a lucky break. Mm -hmm. Rarely do people see things for what they were. When you have a little moment like that, it was like, 
Hmm, yeah, band you love to hate. Imagine that. <laughs> Who would have thought that up? You know, it, it worked for the Rolling Stones in the 60s and it worked for the Sex Pistols in the 70s because they had marketing. I did the same fucking thing in the 80s and the 90s, but with no no marketing, no management, nobody to, to push it through the hoop. And so, you know, but then you come to me with Marilyn Manson in, in the 90s and tell me, oh, yeah, this is what it is. And it still happens to this day, you know. Cardi B is supposed to be the big badass now. Mm -hmm. And they put her, oh, I talked about my pussy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's all just like motherfucker. As long as you got a big budget and people pushing it and calling it something, you can make things as dirty and nasty and weird as you want. But you must have the industry marketing. And since we never had that, it was like, oh, no, you just need to see this for what it is. And they can't. Mm -hmm. And 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 by extension, the fan base can't see that either. Right. You know. Uh, there were years where Iggy Pop was, you know, selling 20, 30 tickets a night, right? And, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, and it was just. I saw was, him at a half full show in San Francisco. Nobody yeah. cared. The mid 80s. He'd come out with blah, blah, blah. Wasn't that an interesting record? Yeah. People didn't really respond. Um, and nobody cared that much to us. It was like, this is Iggy, you yeah. know? <laughs> but the, and, there's um, that one event, I think, when he's train spotting, this random, you know, movie that no one thought was going to blow up that did. And all of a sudden that's propelling him back. So I, right. uh, we've also got this whole Me Too thing that's starting to, the pendulum's kind of swinging back from that, the the extreme Absolutely. of that. And so, so yeah, I'm again, I hold out big hope of a, of a dwarves renaissance, a rediscovery uh, it, during you know, a time I, I when you can appreciate it. I think it would take a movie. It would take a movie and somebody kind of telling the story and people being able to look at it in the privacy of their house and not have it marketed at them. And it's like, well, we've watched everything else on Netflix. That's rock. Let's just watch this. And then you see it and it's like, oh, fuck, these guys are right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they try and do that intermittently. There was that movie a few years ago about that band Death, you know, yep. and all of a sudden everybody was talking about Death. And it was like, look, I want to like this. It's a bunch of black dudes from Washington that were playing you know, something mm -hmm. approaching punk rock in the mid seventies, like, cool. You know, it's a cool idea. It's just the music wasn't any good. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so you're just kind of like, oh, okay. You know, I think if there was a dwarves movie, you know, and that's why I hold out hope. And that's why I own my masters and why I would never get rid of them because right. it's like when sub pop owned things or epitaph owns things or different people own things, then you can't hear it if they don't want you to hear it. So, so you now control right. all the music. You've got all the music. Everything's yeah. accounted for. Is yes. okay. Okay. Has there been discussion? For the most part, there's a couple of outlier things, but I'm not. I'm not worried about the outlier thing. For the most part, I've got everything, and I and I have the rights to reprint everything on vinyl and CD, and and so, yeah, at least it gets to exist. I mean, it hurt my heart when Sub Pop. It's like you're a parent and your kid is being left in a closet by an evil stranger. You know, mm -hmm. you couldn't get "Thank Heaven for Little Girls" or "Sugar Fix" for 25 years. It, it hurt my heart. They didn't care, mm -hmm. you know. And and you know when I when I got those records back, it turned out they had thrown away the original artwork. Even you know it was like so the day that you decided there was no room for this thin piece of cardboard in your warehouse you couldn't just call me and say hey do you want this mm. you know it just had to be yeah fuck them disdainful who cares this is some crappy artwork from this thing it's out of print who gives a shit you know mm. it's like fuck dude i've sold three four thousand copies of those records that came out 30 years ago just over the last two years so obviously people did want them and obviously they, there was a market for it, but even given that they misgaged that and robbed me of tens of thousands of sales that could have happened during that period, mm -hmm. it's just the fact that my kids were locked in a closet that I find unforgivable. I can't forgive you for that. Why did you lock the kids in the closet? You didn't have to do that. You know, you, um, you know, they do these things, you know, either to punish you or because, you know, they just don't care. And I think most of the time it's they just don't care. I don't think there's a lot of malevolent actors in the music industry. There's but I think there's a lot of <laughs> unbridled buffoonery. Yeah. yeah. Buffoonery. <laughs> Stupidity, incompetence, 
not caring, laziness, whatever you want to call it. Right. But I got all my records and you can hear them. And that that's all I ever wanted. I'm curious as to the exceptions that you don't have the rights to. You said. Well, I don't really want to go into that because I think I am going to get them eventually. It, it has to do with just time frames. Got the it. sub pop shit came into the window where you could apply to the Library of Congress for a termination, which I did. Mm-hmm. At which point I hit them up and said, look, guys, you're definitely going to lose this in five years. Do you want some money now to just give it back to me? Or do you want to just keep being lazy and incompetent and not giving a shit and not worrying about it? You can do that. But then I get my record back for free, you know? And so God bless Sonny Bono who made that, uh, push that copyright law through Congress and all bands should know this. If there's any old man bands out here, you know, you're, you're, you can move to terminate that record company, uh, uh, ownership of your thing after 35 years. Mm-hmm. and so you know blood guts was coming up on you know and and you do it in this window of time so after 30 years you put in the application and it all goes through you you you'll get it back in five years so to people who are my age who made a great record who feel like yeah they they buried my kids in the closet and like you can't get my record anymore you can get it back and you should get it back mm-hmm. and to those labels that threw away people's records fuck you you know mm-hmm. You're disgusting. You had one job, stupid. Just keep the records existing. <laughs> but you didn't do it. Has there been serious discussion about a, a, a proper dwarves movie or documentary? Uh, only with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As always, you know, it would it would begin with me, and we would make that thing, and then we'd probably make a trailer and do a GoFundMe and get people interested. You know, eventually. I would like, I think there's a movie there that's interesting and will have wall to wall cool music in it. And like anything, I mean, movies are difficult to make. I think it would need a good director to tie together archival footage and interviews and, you know, a good producer to make, make things make sense. But I think in just like all the dwarves records, it would take me kind of assembling (laughs) everything first and going here's here's the story here's the material here's our thing and then you know once it was just an obvious no-brainer i mean again i could get a deal with epitaph until i had a record done and recess had put it out and he heard it and it was like wow this is great and i'm like well i kept asking you you know it was the same with sub pop they didn't they didn't want to sign us or give us a deal, but I went up there to do their singles club thing, which was two songs. And we did 16 songs or something, 14 songs. And so Jack and Dino said to them, well, these guys can do a whole record in a day. Why don't you just do it? You know? So every time I got a record deal or I got anything from anybody, it was not because they believed in me and we're going to do, th- you know, it was because I, we did all the work. You're driving the bus. We're like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll we'll make some money off this. And so that's how it would go with a movie. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to make the raw materials of that. But it's already there. There's a lot of archival footage of the dwarves and a lot of people who you can interview and speak to. And It's a story waiting to be told, you know, really. And yeah. quite a compelling one, too. So, yeah, I'm very surprised that that's not something that uh, that, that, that exists at this point. Well, you know, I'm going to have to make it exist, right? Just <laughs> like everything else with the dwarves. If it was ever going to happen, I had to make it happen. And God bless the people who helped me. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, uh, you know, that's that's how it's going to have to be. Nobody smart is going to come up to me and go, let's make a movie. It's just not going to happen. That's not how my life has gone, you know. So shifting into record collecting, what do you know as the, the, the most collectible dwarves record? You know, the guy from Extreme Noise Terror made a super limited thing where it's us on one side and them on the other. Mm -hmm. And then it came with like this like enamel pin thing that he had designed. And it was very rare. I think there's like less than 40 copies of that. 31. 31. Okay. So you know about this thing. I think the other very rare thing, um, Stefan Lorchner has a label called No Balls in, uh, in Germany and he's a he's a great guy and he does very limited art pieces so I think he did something that was like I think it's a DVD 
or something and it's a it's a stop me before i fuck again which is a very obscure just album filler song on mm. born again i mean i love this song but it's a very strange thing to do a single of and i think it's a one-sided single or or maybe it's a dvd i don't even know what it is and i think there's like a hundred of those or something I, I don't think there's very many and i think it has like human blood in it or something oh he boy did, he did some strange thing so there's a few things like that um you know, Sub Pop lied a lot about, um, it, it's impossible to know what the early editions of Blood Guts or Thank Heaven were because they wouldn't tell the truth about how much of something they had printed. Mm -hmm. And so, and so it's hard to know from those things. Maybe there were limited ones, like there's only 10 gray ones or whatever, but I wouldn't really know about that. Reportedly, the pink marble and the gray ones, I mean, this is the sort of knowledge I somehow collect uh pink marble and gray ones are about 150 each in quantity is that right the, well that's yes, according yes. to the uh, to, 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 I, I wish i would have saved some i wish they would have given me some i wish mm -hmm. they would have told me that those were happening i don't even think i was aware of it at the time okay i mean it, it was very uh need to know basis with those people you know and and uh um you know, and then we would go to their warehouse. I mean, we needed money for food. Yeah. I would, I would, I would steal, you know, 10 45s from the sub pop warehouse when I was up there and go, you know, be back in San Francisco and sell them at a record store. And those things, if I would have held on to those, they would probably be worth money now too, you know, mm -hmm. but we needed to eat. You know? Sure. I mean, and back then who, who would have thought that people would be paying these exorbitant amounts for these, these records you know yeah and again you know I, I i didn't think like a collector in that sense i once i was making records i i said this is just for the ages you know mm -hmm. but i'm glad people are obsessed with the gray vinyl or the pink marble because it means they love this and that they want it you know or maybe they're just a fanatical collector type but with you know i mean it means that's how they express their love you know that's what that's what makes it mean something to them you know for me the making of the record was really the the important part you know mm -hmm. and the most fun part of a song is when it's it's up here and you're like oh man they're really gonna trip on this you're, you're one of the few bands that still does a lot of seven inches or regularly does seven inch records it must be a labor love because seven inch records are they tend to be more effort than <laughs> return yeah yeah, yeah. They, they don't make sense anymore because it costs as much to make a seven inch as a 12 inch. So almost nobody will make them, but I know a couple guys that will still make them dirty. Donnie, who's a buddy of mine, a great poster artist and uh, done stuff for lots of big mainstream acts and lots of cool underground acts. He's making a single from the concept album. That was this, you know, super printed uh, thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh a picture disc and whatever i still uh, haven't seen it i think it's taken a while to, to finish but um yeah i love a good seven inch i i think they're cool um mm -hmm. i always have but uh, but i know i understand why people don't make them i mean you notice i don't have any on my label but uh the guy from uh, rad girlfriend did a couple for me and i really loved them and they sold quick and uh, he's a cool guy and he still likes to do them i guess he's got a deal for for making them so I haven't been able to figure out a way to make it cost of effective, you know, but, uh, he does. So it's like, all right, great. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, black, I want to make sure everyone knows the dwarves keep it real. There are vinyl copies at dwarves.merchtable.com. I'll put links in this episode page. If there's the limited edition cover still available by some ungodly chance, grab a copy. Cause again, I think there's only a couple hundred of those available. And yeah, uh, the silver vinyl ones with the uh, Magical Mystery Tour. I think there's still like 30 of those left. So, oh, get good. It and pick them up. Good. I got mine on the way. So, uh, they're also signed, which is great when you buy something from merch table, dwarves.merchtable.com. It's signed, it's from the band, and it That's looks right. to, you know, it goes, it goes direct to helping uh, th keep this machine running. Um, Blag, you are welcome back anytime, mate. And we look forward to uh, seeing you down under. Thank you for talking to me, bud. I really appreciate it. Ah, there he is, Mr. Blog Dahlia. Dwarves, again, keep it real. 
and the Dwarves concept album and the rest of their catalog are available on streaming. And of course, vinyl copies are at dwarves.merchtable.com or you could see them live and you could pick up the vinyl from the merch table direct. Much of it is signed. They're good guys. They'll probably draw and scribble on it if you want. But again, dwarves.merchtable.com or if you're in Australia, catch Dwarves with me first in the Gimme Gimme's this November, sbmpresents.com. And don't forget, there is an extended version of this interview only available to show patrons, patreon.com slash vinyl <laughs> Alrighty, that's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please share these episodes on social media. Put them out on Facebook and put them in the Reddit forums and the Facebook groups. Reshare our images from Instagram. That is hugely appreciated. And huge thanks to everyone who's leaving positive reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That's a huge help as well. We'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time, get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers. Cheers.